Hello, a few of you have been uh, quite enjoying Brutalski, Russian patriot at the front, ill-equipped and wearing a funny hat. But uh, he's actually got, well, he sometimes calls him his brother, maybe he's his manager, but is in fact Misha Faro, who was, uh, or has been, and continues to be quite a poster on Quora. It's a Q&A website. People ask a question and... Um, panel of experts, or a bunch of people who say they are, give answers. Uh, most of them, well, interesting, if nothing else. Now, when Misha was answering people's questions about Russia, his answers were usually sardonic, uh, witty, and he amassed something like, I think, 27,000 followers. Like followers in anything, uh, most of them are a little bit on the inactive side. I mean, I've got 10,000, but I'm sure some of them are dead. <laughs> anyway, you know, a little quiet, you could say that. But he... Look, his followers actually came to his aid. When the crunch came and all the sanctions went in, Misha didn't lose his job, but he stopped getting paid. Uh, he couldn't move money around. He certainly couldn't even pay his rent it was a German owner, so that meant an international transfer. He was stuck. and But here's the interesting thing. He had an unusual upbringing, um, you know, Russian-born, and certainly in a small town, so that's traditional in that way, but found himself living and working in the United States, teaching English at a, well, it was at a British school in Russia, and spent time in Israel, and enough, of course, to learn English and Hebrew, which is no easy thing. And he'll explain a bit about his life, the challenges there, and how he came to see things the way they are. Let's get into it. Misha Fira. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm here, and the other half of... Uh, I'm in London, of course, but and the other half is in Moscow. And it's right in the middle of this uh, extraordinary time. And I'm with Misha. And Misha Farah is uh, kind of as caught in the middle as I guess anyone could be. Uh, hi, Misha. How's it going just hi, today? <laughs> uh, bright skies again for two weeks. For this whole duration of our special military operation, it's been bright skies every day, cloudless, very unusual, extremely unusual. I don't remember seeing anything like that for uh, like years. Would you, really say, nice would you say that this, uh, when you go out in the street, is it uh, just like normal times, normal hard no, times? No, definitely not. Uh, well, few people outside. Um, not so many people outside as normal, but that was a bit the case during the pan pandemic. Mm. So this is a bit like a repeat. So few people outside, not so many cars driving around. But the faces, if you look at the faces, there's something else, very subdued, kind of low energy. Uh, yeah, you can see just something not right with people on the street. Now, you've lived in... Uh... The United States, you've taught at a, a British school and spent time uh, in Israel um, and kind of absorbed yourself in, in the cultures there. Do you think that uh, experience in other places has um, either helped or changed or added to your uh, sense of yourself as Russian? Um, well, uh, when you have... Well, uh, the first time I was in Israel, we were told there was a group of students. Uh, I was 17 and uh, we had a psychologist and he told us, Felix, his name was Felix. And he told us that you cannot walk back to the same river twice. So if you left, so they say, look, they told us you've been here for, for a month. Maybe you'll go back in two months, but you won't be the same person. Uh, just spending three months in another country. Uh, it has it has changed you. It has changed you and will change even more. So the longer you spend there. So obviously, uh, um, you cannot be the same person coming back, uh, same person as you were. So yeah, it changes you a lot in many ways. 
And uh, probably the greatest change is that you can you start looking at um, people and situations sort of from a distance, you, like an observer. You become more of, of a person who observes things, uh, look look at the things, and uh, come up with your own sort of ideas. You can, also lots of comparisons. You start comparing things. Oh, it's like this in this country. Oh, it's like that in that country. Uh, and yet you yeah, grew up in a uh, what it was it country town in in small place yeah well, I, I yeah i was born in ulyanovsk which is a um that's birthplace of lenin uh -huh. and, and then when i was two years old i uh i had headaches like really bad headaches and my mom sent me to her parents um country house village in the village more like a settlement in vologda region this is where they're from it's up north Right. Uh, I would drive from Moscow north. So I spent there, uh, I lived there till I was seven and went back to school in Ulyanovsk. And every summer I went to that same village. And interestingly that in that um, in that place, people speak di Russian dialect. It's not like Russian, it's quite different. It, you know, lots of different words and it sounds differently. So every time I would go back every summer, I would go back. I have to. I had to relearn the language. I relearned that dialect. Really? Yeah. Uh, so to to communicate with the locals. But it was a bit like I would speak like normal Russian, standard Russian, but I would understand what they would tell me. And it. I think uh, you mentioned once before to me that it was perhaps a little like part of the Finnish group of languages or, or something like that. I don't know. It's they have absorbed like. Uh, well, it's close to these. Uh, Scandinavia and the people there have those looks of more like Scandinavian people. There are lots of blonde uh, people, blonde hair. Right. Uh, the thing is, it was a different dialect. And uh, so every time I would go back uh, to Janus, so for nine months I would speak sort of like standard Russian and then I would go there and I would just learn this new language. And interestingly, mm. my, my sister, my cousin, uh, well, she came with me from Moscow and she had to do the same learning thing. And now she lives in Italy and she speaks Italian very well. Okay. And then also some of the uh, children uh, who came to that village during summer, I then I heard they also actually live in other countries and speak their languages. So I think this has, an, has affected us in some ways that we have to learn a new language. Every, every summer you have to uh, adapt to the new language. That's, uh, that's really interesting that it seems like um, because we have that peak learning period in early childhood for languages, to have gone through that thing where you're getting something that's got a different sound to it and tone and, and way of delivery is a big advantage when you grow up. By the I think so. And I, I can see from other uh, other kids that time who went through it and it, it yeah, it somehow it changed them as well. Yeah. Now, in the United States, whereabouts were you living there? Well, uh, it was a long story. I went there to find my father. Okay. <laughs> what was he doing there? Uh, well, he uh, uh, he left. He is from Crimea. Uh -huh. um, yeah. Yes, so I'm like a bit also connected to the peninsula. <laughs> well, uh -huh. at, in 1991, he uh, he had a business there, and uh, and I think he had problems with mafia, and uh, I think he got. Scary then he left. Uh, I'm sorry, you mean a business in Crimea or in America? Yes, he had the computer uh, business. He, uh, he sold computers. He brought computers from Europe and sold them in Crimea. And then he had some problems with, you okay. know, with crooks and thugs. Uh, and uh, they, I think he just took his business and he left to the U.S. with his son. Was Has Crimea got uh, a local reputation in the business world as uh, being targets of uh, criminal groups? Or no, I don't think so. It's just... It just he just was from there. He lived there. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. it was just the same all across the country. I think. I think I don't think Crimea was any different. And how did you uh, did you have any luck finding your father in America? Well, uh, I did not grow up with him, so I was a bit curious uh, to find him. Uh, obviously, being my father. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I found him uh, in California. I had his name and I found him, uh, but it did not go well. And uh, and I spent some time with his former girlfriend and Della Peretti, and she's the her son. 
is John Peretti is the founder of uh, BuzzFeed and uh, okay the other projects that he has. And um, so I stayed at her place, and she taught me some English, and she helped me with writing. Um, of so course, because that, that's an, another uh, uh, big difference. Um, the Cyrillic alphabet uh, is it. It's a bit misleading at first, isn't it? Well, f for a Westerner, it is because. Uh, some of the letters have approximately the same sounds, but a lot of them have a kind of a, a Greek origins. But yeah. um, it's it's a, in a way there's so many similarities um, because there's a, a upper and lower case in Russian and then handwriting style and so on. I believe the Romanov, uh, the last of the Romanov imperial family, uh, spoke privately in English between each other so they're especially at the end so their their guards didn't understand what they were saying so it was um uh, but the it was common german they married german they took german wives through yeah. Yeah. so it was pretty much a, a european the the uh the elites were they've been european up till the bolshevik revolution so they spoke german french english mm, yeah i mean that, that yeah. was the time when french was a the language of diplomacy, <laughs> but not anymore. Was, so at, at one point, the, uh, the German wasn't trained, so they spoke German. Now the time French so is changing with the times, but they are this. Yeah, they spoke in a European language. And, and it, when I worked as a tutor here in Moscow, yes. and I, I saw how the, the, the rich people here in Moscow, they tried to uh, sort of recreate that atmosphere. So they would all the children would speak English as as their mother tongue. Really? Funny, funny, yeah. So they have all, many, many families, uh, and their kids had like British nannies, um, right. uh, British tutors, and they went so they attended the Br British schools, and they would just speak English with each other. Uh, and then I was at a party of uh, my former boss in Italy, um, and uh, so they had a long table with all the, his friends, and they obviously they all spoke Russian. And then separately, there was a long table where their kids sat and attended by the nannies and British tutors and the nannies. And I, I just I stood by the table and listened and they all spoke English with each other. <laughs> it wow. was just crazy. Like you have just all the adults speak Russian and all the kids speak English. So they recreate they, they, It's like in the Russian DNA, like the top, the upper class, mm. the upper class is European, lower classes, they're, they're Russian speakers. Uh, now, do you, this was a, a conscious um, effort to do this in their families, was it? I think it's both, like conscious and unconscious. That it's right. just sort of it's been on like that for for three or four hundred years, with the interruption of Bolshevik Revolution. Uh, so after, the, but that's like eighty years. So eighty okay. years later, they decided they want to go yeah. back to how it was. But now it's sort of, I think, again, it's. Going back to the Soviet times, they're all gone. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Yeah, I mean, right. look, do you, uh, it's as uh, as we speak. Um, there's a a move to blame uh, the West, of course, for uh, the domestic problems in Russia, and um, effectively kind of breaking. Um, I don't think it was that close anyway, but um, breaking the. the the forming bonds of westernization and so on. Um, it that kind of damage can go on for a long time. Do you think, let's say in some imaginary world, all the problems of this year are somehow solved by the end of the year? And do, how long would it take um, a more progressive, uh, well, I shouldn't even say that it's biased, uh, a more westernized uh, Russia to start taking hold? Would it be a few years, 20 years? What well, think? I, I think the, the main issue here is that only the upper classes I, I did, have identified themselves with uh, West and in Europe. Uh, sort of the lower classes and including probably the middle class as well, because middle class, they adapt to the whatever, whoever, uh, yeah. whatever situation is. But the rest of the people, the, the vast majority of population, they they're not they've never been Western and they they just they don't don't really care, to be honest. 
But the, the upper classes, I think even if things get back to normal, they're extremely fearful now and scared that even if things get back to normal, it, it will just be gone again in a second. So there's this fear that might not be gone for quite a while. So people just, regardless of what you know, turns for the better in a short term, there, there'll always be this fear that, wow, uh, look, that happened so quickly, it well, could happen it's, again. It's very complicated because in the West, I mean, with all the things that happened against oligarchs, um, like yeah. I, I have friends there, so they live in Italy. Uh, well, the friends, my, my clients, uh, they live in Italy. Well, they are, by Western definition, I would put them in upper middle class. Well, by Russian standards, they're rich, but okay. more like upper middle class. Uh, but they're they're staying there now in Italy, but they're very much afraid that they might get kicked out of there. So once sort of West is finished with oligarchs, they finished with the rich, then they will uh, continue with upper middle class Russians. So now you have Russians who are afraid to stay there in Europe. And there are Russians who are afraid to stay in Russia. And this is very, I, this is the first time it happened. But normally, Russians um, have problems in Russia. Well, communism, mm -hmm. uh, Bolshevik revolution, or, uh, or whatever. Uh, they could always go to the West. But now, they're also not in a good position there as well. <laughs> this, this is the first time it happened. So it's because of that, it's very hard to predict what's going to happen next. It, you're but, right. It's, it's, uh, this, I, can't, I can't think of any situation that's quite been the same. Um, not since, uh, oh, I don't know, not since the the revolution. But uh, in the revolution, they were accepted. Uh, Russians who were like upper class. Uh, um, oh, yeah, mostly. Family, though were, the, the royal family here was actually fearful of taking the Romanovs in. in yeah, case, but I'm talking about not the... Tsar, but more like upper classes. Oh, yeah. That's millions true. that fled. All those millions that fled from Russian Revolution. They were, I mean, nobody kicked them out of France or the States. Yeah. But now they, they're living there <laughs> and uh, they're afraid that there will be next. There's something um, else you could probably help. Uh, and this is, again, I guess, from a, a Western point of view, because we have the same uh divides between people who think one way and people who think another um, this is certainly the case in the united states which is a little bit i think uh more divided than perhaps britain is where people here are they're not passionate believers in any damn thing you know and everything is a joke so uh that's probably the easiest way to get through life but i saw um, a good report on it was actually about the Ukrainian railways, how it was functioning and how big it was, because it is, you know, physically big country. And there was a woman there who was on a kind of temporary clinic set up in Lviv uh, station, and she was a, a doctor. And she was telling of telephone conversations with her sister, who was, I think, in um, St. Petersburg. And they were in touch, and, and the sister in, in Russia was you know, wanting to know how she was keeping and if she was all right. But as things got worse, the divide between the sisters got worse and worse. The sister in Ukraine could not get the sister in uh, in Russia to accept um, the reality as she was describing it. And what seems to me surprising, okay, sure, there's lots of families who divide over, I don't know, everything from politics to relationships or whatever. But I, from a British point of view, some fundamental facts, uh, you can interpret the facts as you wish, but I mean, to not accept your own family's reporting of something. Uh, I mean, these sisters completely fell out, told each other to fuck off and everything. Um, well... It, it almost seems like there's a um, a desire in for for a lot of Russians to to want to accept official views of things. Would that be right? Yeah, I, I mean, I uh, stopped watching. Uh, well, from twenty well, I was, from twenty fourteen, let's say, I just stopped watching any news. 
uh, Russian news. And uh, it just because I at at the office when I walked into uh, in the in our cafeteria. Was, like, By the way, what what do you do there? What what sort of business was it? Uh, I, well, I'm sort of still, I think, employed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but <laughs> I it was get back, I, I'll go something. back to the office uh, on Monday you, because we have our uh, boss's birthday. Yeah, um, okay. and um, it's a pharmaceutical company, uh, right. and my boss is uh, the owner, founder, uh, investor. He's just, uh, yeah, everything. Right. And, um, he's like a bit of a, like. Putin. <laughs> yeah, all right. Just so I interrupted you. You were saying when uh, you found that. Uh, well, I just the the TV is always on in the kitchen of our in our office. We have this kitchen and sort of a, in the dining room thing, and there's a big TV on the wall. It's always on. It's always on to Russia 24. This is the second ch channel. Channel two. Channel one is. Um, it's a bit old fashioned. I think they're just not up to date with all the new technologies. And uh, Channel 2 is a bit like a, uh, like a feed, you know, there's always new, new news, a bit structured more like CNN. Right. Um, just news nonstop, basically. And uh, Channel 1 is a bit sort of this old fashioned uh, Soviet news where you have just uh, some news, then a movie, then uh, some shows. But uh, Russia 24 just news nonstop. Okay. Uh, um, yeah, and it's always on. But and the thing is, when I walk in, it's like the message from the screen is just first of all, it's just this emotional, extremely emotional, very subjective. It's like this just opinion of one person, extreme mm -hmm. with extremely emotional impact, just just telling straight just the same thing over and over and over again. And it's it's just like uh, I watch it and then realize that people. In Russia, I have been watching it for eight years, nonstop. I mean, it's just a natural. And my, I think my fault is I, I thought, oh well, probably they just don't, don't really pay attention to it that much. And now I realize, no, no, it's, 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 it's it has had a tremendous impact on, uh, on the way they think and on the way they perceive things. Right. But like literally for eight years, that's been just one very subjective messages drumming into their head day after day so uh i guess that can happen in any society of course uh, yeah it just happened here i mean that's... but there, uh, there is a uh okay okay and I, I think it's a um progressive sort of western idea richard dawkins the uh, uh, biologist uh, often tells the story that when he was at university they had a professor who was who had a particular view of how uh, biology works, and he'd been teaching that for uh, twenty years and and had success with it. I had a visiting professor, a younger guy from somewhere else, uh, I don't know where, didn't really matter, who gave a talk and actually demonstrated that uh, everything that that old professor had been teaching was wrong, that he'd gone off in an interesting way, but on the wrong track and got more and more tangled in being wrong. Yeah. And so now the old professor was there at this big hall, which was packed out because people knew what was coming. The old professor stood up and went to the younger man and shook his hand and thanked him for what had happened that day. He, he was so glad that it had. And, and Dawkins says that those young students clapped themselves to death. So impressed were they by that, you know, he was somebody who could let go of his ideas because he knew he was wrong. And now, I, in a sense, that tradition itself in, in, in Britain, probably every damn where is, is gone a bit. But um, th there is a part of, certainly from a British point of view, and I guess from an American one, where you don't mind being proved a dickhead, you know, you don't, it's somehow a relief when something's demonstrated that this is all nonsense. Uh, but perhaps being lied to is a different category, huh? I don't know. Um, well, on, on Telegram, uh, there are just all lots of people typing comments in Russian, as in like, wake up, you've been brainwashed in Russia, just wake up, just stop, stop, stop believing what you're watching on TV, stop, stop, wake up. 
but mm. but it's been it's been going on for eight years and that's fringe it, anyway isn't it as yeah, you said imagine it's almost a decade of of it's it's been a long time it's been a long time uh it's it's gone for a long time uh but yeah so it's it's hard to say what's gonna happen like what i well the thing is at schools and in, in the in my um, daughter's preschool when the, the whole thing started i uh, asked her teacher um like what 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 are you going to tell kids about the situation and uh, she said look we uh nothing uh yeah. It's, it's yeah we're not taking any sides and and then i heard from other um from other teachers in other other schools in moscow a bit more progressive school let's put it this way they don't take sides which is like it's not at all business so they understand that you know what they've been hearing on the tv is not exactly true yeah. or, uh, but they decided not just to stand aside and you know, so take the they're taking the position like those at the UN who abstain from voting. They're, they're, yeah. they're just not saying exactly. anything. Absolutely. Yes. And is in, um, well, the position is a few men in power and not necessarily only in Russia, but in other countries as well, yeah. including the United States, they have decided for this thing to go to start and continue. And only they know why they did it. And only they are in power because they did it. That was their decision. Um, and only they know what's the end game, this whole thing. And uh, it's not in our power to stop it or we're just going to just stay away from. The well, I mean, in, in a sense, that's an optimistic view that at least there's somebody who knows what the hell they're doing. Um, I think uh, <clears throat> often in human affairs, um, Perhaps it's so that uh, you know the, the, many say that the um, Putin himself was not very open with um, his own um, not just commanders but his his own political team as to uh, how this would all play out. Oh, or maybe he was. Who knows? But uh, you know that the ambition was that. Um, uh, like uh, Crimea, they just roll over and all of that. But, you know, you, you do have information services. You, you're supposed to have intelligence on the ground. And he, you know, uh, used to pride himself. He even published somewhat plagiarized papers on international relations. So um, should have been able to read the um, Ukrainian character somewhat better. Well, uh, well, the thing is that we get sort of reports that the FSB, which is former KGB, yeah. um, his financial economical team and uh, even the army, everybody got caught off guard. Nobody nobody knew it was coming. So, okay. so the consensus here is that only Putin Politburo, his inner circle, which is like 10 or 12 people or something like that, only they knew and only they planned the whole thing. And in this situation, it's very easy to sort of distance yourself from this whole mess, because if only 10 people made up this decision, and then, then we're not in the power to stop it. Then that would not... hardly be uh, fair on the army in a way, because uh, if you know that you're, um, instead of doing a training exercise uh, on the borders, if, uh, if you know well in advance that, uh, no, you've got to, go into a huge uh, territory and maintain uh, a supply force, not just for, I mean, that they were already kind of a bit drained for having done all those exercises for some time. They were drained but, from exercise and then they ate all the ratios by, you know, hmm. by February. They've been there, they were there for quite a while. And um, so sort of the thinking part of uh, Russians, they this is their. I, I this is what I sense that they decided it's just some small group of people in Kremlin and probably not just in Kremlin but also in Washington started this whole mess and uh, it's just not a, not our business. And uh, well, you know, uh, by the way, I haven't caught up with it. Why would Washington have an interest in letting it start? Well, why would they? Um, well, in this theory. Yeah. 
in in theory, uh, naturally, uh, Russia cannot win this uh, operation. In this oh, country. I see. You're saying they pushed them into a fool of shame. They, they basically they trapped them. So the thing is, they, they, they provoked them with uh, all this, oh, they're going to start a war tomorrow. Oh, they're going to start a war hmm. tomorrow. Oh, it's going to happen any day now. Oh, look at them. Look at them. Oh, look, Ukraine is developing a nuclear bomb. Oh, hmm. they have the biological labs. So they have this all these provocations going on, and since the president is a bit on the, he's from the uh, former KGB. Obviously, he's uh, a bit mm. uh, susceptible to these kind of things, and maybe somebody in his Politburo is in CIA's pocket, so they pushed him into this thing, although nobody wanted it to happen. Something like that, okay? Right. Okay. So uh, basically, the mm. consensus of thinking Russians that it's completely ha- not had nothing to do with them. Or with any political, or economical, or any institutions, nobody wanted it, and uh, let them just do whatever they like. Leave us alone. I suppose I, too the the sanctions that have come around because they are unprecedented. They hadn't ever been applied to any place at this level. And well, we haven't felt the impact just yet. No, you no, no. You see, now it's a bit of inertia. I mean, okay, we we see every day the things the things are deteriorating, but they have not gone to that point, especially in Moscow, because they all have a bit of savings. Mm. So I mean, every day you can see. So okay, no McDonald's. Oh, yeah. we still use the McDonald's. Now it's closed. Uh, no Instagram. Well, we'll use it. No, no Instagram. So every day it's a bit a new thing coming, but it's it's dragged on. It's not happening on the same day or same week. So. Mm. People are still sort of living with, you know, the old ways yes. and not adapted entirely to what's going on, I think. Well, yeah. if it went on for six months, uh, with the, then certainly the sanctions would have six months, uh, an effect. I, it, um, of course. Uh, but then it also depends on the place. I mean, obviously here people have a bit more money, mm. but in uh, smaller places, I, I it's... It's really bad there already. Really? Okay. Yeah. Um, but but um, I haven't been there, so it's... You, you can tell me. Um, I suppose it's, uh, from an outsider's point of view, we get um, a bit of um, the more open-minded thinkers from uh, Russia. We, uh, we get Russian media. But I, I would say that in such a huge country with so many spread about um, towns and cities and places where things are different, and as you get towards the you know outer edges of it, different again, you know, you know quite, for for most people, all of this is it's just nothing much to do with them, I guess, unless they have yeah exactly you know, a friend who who uh, his son is in the army or something, but it's, I mean, you've got over 200 million people and the army's not that big and out of the army, there's not that many, 200,000. Look, they're trying to minimize damage. They're sending uh, convicts. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah, they're sending uh, volunteers from Syria. They're sending Chechens. They're sending um, mercenaries. So they're mm. trying to minimize, to minimize damage and to get as you you know dead bodies of regular soldiers because that would have impact obviously but if mm. you send convicts um party to uh, professional soldiers uh, I, well but they, don't con- send, they don't have they don't have conscription uh and, and bring in one million then it's i mean obviously that would have a huge impact on uh you know, i can imagine you know, from uh, the Western point of view, it's not any longer possible for a, a, an elected leader to start a conflict where um, even their professional standing armies are having the, the young soldiers killed because with every single death, there is virtually it's you know, same, a, yeah, it's the same Facebook here. family and, here. And, yeah. and, and Ukrainians play it very well. So they, when they always emphasize, they, you know, take photos and videos of young conscripts because they know that that will have impact. Yeah, See, they don't care yeah. about mercenaries, Chechens, and that that doesn't work. But those guys, that will impact the general feeling uh, over this whole affair. 
Um, I'm going to come back in a minute with Michelle. I'll just put a little break in here. And I was, I'm was i going to ask him about uh, that subject of um, uh, playing media in different ways because there's some unique features which, and to a degree, is perhaps hiding a greater truth. Anyway, I'll see you all in a minute, or maybe even next week. That's part one of the interview with uh, Misha Fira. You know, one of the interesting things uh, I always find with people who've lived in uh, different cultures, different countries, and especially speak different languages, and well enough so they've kind of absorbed themselves into those worlds, I always want to know whether their character changed in any way when they were part of that new language or that group of people. I, I think I've told people many times that a musician friend spoke half a dozen languages and when he'd speak a language, his views on things would actually change. His outlook depended on which language he was speaking and absorbed in. Uh, of course, he was a musician, so anything can happen, but it seems to have application. And we'll hear more from Misha about that one in part two, which will be coming up soon.